in one of the announcements, uh, we missed to remind you that there is a weekly church prayer after, right after the VBS this Wednesday evening. We will also have a time of uh, church prayer, uh, so please don't miss to be part of that as well. So uh, let's turn our Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12. We are in this series from the Gospel of Mark, where we are letting the shining Gospel of Jesus Christ shine brighter in our lives, and uh, that the life and the work of our Lord Jesus may continue to transform us as we look closely to the Mark's account of our Lord Jesus' life. So Mark chapter 12, we will read from verses 24 to 32. Um, let me, sorry, yeah. Mark chapter 20, yeah, chapter 12, verses 28 to 34, sorry. I'm going to read from ESV uh, translation, so follow me and read the alternate verses with me. Mark Suvartha Parindu Adhyayamu, Irvai Indu Vachinam Ninchi, Muppai Nalgo Vachinam Varuku, March March Chadukuna. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Verse 34, and when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said unto him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Let us pray and look to the Lord. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for this privilege you give, that you are letting our lives come under the light, the transforming light of thy gospel which has the power unto salvation, and also which is the power of sanctification that works deep in us, Lord, uh, to continue to save us from this world that is decaying around us. Father, we come desiring that you would speak to us, desiring that you would make your word our very portion, that our lives would be given the strength given the grace, given all the, Lord, the uh, heart willingness in surrendering ourselves to have your word lived out in our lives. And so as we come with such expectant hearts, Lord, we ask that you would speak to us this morning. Unworthy as I am, as I stand here, Father, I ask that you would speak to me, through me, to each one of us. Lord, that our lives may be renewed in our minds, that our lives may be regenerated, Lord, for those that are yet to receive Thee. And Lord, for our lives to be revived in Thee, Lord, that we may serve Thee passionately, that we may serve Thee and live the full meaning and the purpose for why, Lord, we are upon this earth. We ask that You would bless our time together. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. story is told of a patient uh, who was coming to the doctor and uh, along with his 
spouse, uh, the husband is getting to hear this news that uh, doctor, after looking at the tests that have been uh, done, he was telling to, his hus uh, to her husband, your wife has only three more months to live, and I'm so sorry to tell you that. Then the man said, no need to say sorry, doctor. I have lived for 20 years with her, and I can manage the rest of three months as well. I hope none of us uh, are having such spouses. Um, and uh, when we think about such news, when we think about uh, doctors giving us uh, prescriptions, usually, we never see that as mandate. We never see it so serious until news comes to such extreme scenarios. Say, suppose if the doctor is giving you good, healthy recommendations, why don't you do one hour exercise a week? That's going to help your heart. That's going to help uh, you with good health. We never take that as mandate. We only take it as a, a good suggestion, right? But when we come to our Lord, often uh, we can come to the scripture, we can come to the commandments that we find in the Bible as good suggestions. We can also come to them as good recommendations that if it is convenient, if it is possible, if it is not too discomfortable, we would try to take them. But not so with regards to the commandments that God has given to us. And uh, as we come to today's portion, we are in the midst of this session that Jesus had given before he comes and looks uh, to go and atone for the sins of mankind. The groups of the religious authorities that were there who were unmistakably wanting Jesus to be trapped and to be put to death at any cost, we're wanting to fire some questions, give some tricky questions so that they can ensnare him, trap him, and make him to say something wrong whereby they can get him to be put to death. And in the midst of that, we saw that Jesus faces some practical question, actually one practical question, and then last week we saw that he takes in a spiritual question. The practical question about the taxes, whether it is right to pay taxes to Caesar. The spiritual question with regards to the Sadducees asking about resurrection and the assumptions that they have made, which they actually put forth as a question to Jesus. And today, we're going to look at this biblical question that Jesus is uh, given. And as Jesus is given this biblical question, the interesting thing that we come to note is that there is this marveling that we have seen last week in particular about the answers that Jesus gave. The answers Jesus gave were astonishing. Matthew says that they were astonished when Jesus gave the answer because they couldn't find any fault with it, nor they were not expecting such a perfect answer. And uh, that marvel of the answer that is in Jesus is what we have come to see. Not that he has the answers to these questions that life brings, but more importantly, he has the answer in himself. The problems that life brings to, our li to us need not just some reasoning answers, but the very person of Jesus to be right with us. When suffering comes, when trials come, when difficult situations come, you don't need answers to it. You just need somebody who understands us and who can actually lead us through them and out of them in a victorious way. And so we saw last week that the marvel of the answer in Jesus is more than just that he can give answers to our questions but that he has the answers in himself, that he is with us through life circumstances and situations. And so now this week, we're going to look at the mandate and the meaning in Jesus. When I say that, 
Uh, we come to this biblical question, which is very interesting, that it comes from a lawyer. Lawyers are those of these religious people, mostly among the Pharisees, that were the, who had this important job of trying to make copies of the scripture. They were the ones who, instead of this Xerox machines that are there, which does the copying work, or in, 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 in fact, in India, Nobody calls them as copier machines. People call them as Xerox machines. They, they, it had become so natural that that is how uh, the company Xerox has come to become known, that it is Xerox machines, not copier. I used to myself call that way. <laughs> I don't know about you. But that work of copying something, just exactly dot to dot, without any deviation from what they see in the original to the copy, is what the scribes, this sect of uh, religious people, were given. And so they were meticulously copying the law so that people can have copies in the next generations. And uh, if you are uh, familiar with these, um, the, with, with the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were copies that were found. Uh, they're not originals per se, but copies that were found much close to the very first century. So much so that it, it actually matches to the other copies that were there from the uh, timeline of 250-300 AD that were there earlier than that. So when we come to this particular group of people called the scribes, they were the one who were in, who were interested, whose life and job was centered around the scriptures. And so, very interestingly, they have this question with regards to the scripture, which is a biblical question. Now, coming to chapter, 20, chapter 12, verses 28, we come to see that Jesus was asked uh, this question. The scribe who asked this question had seen that the answer that Jesus gave to the Sadducees who didn't believe in resurrection was fabulous. It was so, uh, it was so bullseye that there's no more uh, questioning that was required. And so we see that the scribe was happy that Jesus answered for them because he was probably a Pharisee, as we see in Matthew's account, that he was actually a Pharisee. Matthew chapter 22, 35, we get to see that portion, a parallel portion of the lawyer who was a Pharisee or a scribe who is a Pharisee who comes up with this biblical question. Now here, as one of the scribe came and having heard them reasoning together, that is they were discussing, they were reasoning about the answers and perceiving that he had answered them well, the answer that Jesus gave was because he himself is the wisdom of God. He himself is the one who has the very mind of God and the very person of God, the second person in the triune God, that he knew the way he had, uh, he had designed man and he had seen that he is a God who is life and resurrection that he claims to be in a later point of time in John chapter 11, verses 25, we get to see that he claims himself to be the life and resurrection. And so he answered perfectly. And after he sees that the question about resurrection was answered perfectly, this scribe comes about and asks this question, which is the first commandment of all? When we come to this question, we ought to remember that this question has a significance of what is the mandate? What is the command that God had given for mankind in general. And in fact, he's not asking all the commandments. What is the first one, the foremost one? In uh, ESV translation, we've seen that it is called the most important one, right? As we got to note there. And uh, when we see that these questions, that the question that the scribe had was centered around the mandate that God has for mankind, we come to see that the answer that Jesus gives was again spot on. He goes to his favorite book, the book from which he happens to quote a number of times. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, we, got, we come to read this portion that every Jewish 
uh, person would have been memorizing right from their childhood. It is called the Shema of the Jewish people, the, the thing that the Jewish people have to hear right from their childhood. And uh, Shema is a word meaning hear. It's a call to hearing. And uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, which is where Jesus quotes from, which is the summary and the substance of all the essence of the law, where we read in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And then in verse 5, we come to see the greatest commandment or the first commandment. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And when we look at this, this comes from Exodus chapter 20, verse 1, where in the first of the Ten Commandments that God had given, we see that the first is that we are to love our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. And Jesus adds here in the midst, with all of our mind. In verse 30, we read, as Jesus relays, that Shema, or the prayer of every Jewish person, he says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. There is this portion that is added where he says, with all thy mind. Not that it was not given in the Old Testament, it was implied, but Jesus explicitly calls it out, that you and I ought not to just love God, with our affections of our heart, or with our affections and emotions, which is the heart, the soul, that is the spirit part of our being, the strength, that is all our body and our strength, but also with our mind, where the, the channel to our heart is through our mind. Many a times, if we are to get our affections realigned, it is by thinking along with somebody who gives us the thoughts to get to our heart that we get to develop new affections. And so Jesus puts uh, the very same first commandment in its right context and right uh, light where he brings it clearly. And then he also adds the second commandment which is inseparable. The commandment that we ought to love our neighbor as our own self is inseparable with the commandment of loving our God. If you are to love God and not be able to love our neighbor, it actually is going to be contradictory very soon. Uh, there are many religions of this world who would say, for the love of God, they would persecute others. Not so with the very intent that God of the Bible, in the very person of Jesus Christ, is revealed. That he happened to teach and practice and show to us, as he taught, that we ought to love not just our neighbor, but also our enemy, in that when Jesus was put on the cross, he prays and says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And when we look at this, we come to see that this whole section of the scripture in the interaction that Jesus has with the scribe can simply be divided into these four things quickly. The first one is the raised question that the scribe asked. The second one is the right answer that Jesus gave. The spot on answer that Jesus gave. To the right answer that Jesus gave, we come to see that there is this reflective acceptance that the scribe gives. In verses 32, he gives a reflective acceptance. What you said was true. It was right. And not only he affirms that, he also accepts that. and. He reflects that what answer Jesus gave is so true and so perfect to the scriptures. And apart from the raised question and the right answer and the reflective acceptance, we see Jesus actually has a receptive encouragement. He's welcoming the scribe who answered wisely, as we saw in the ESV translation, Discreetly, as KJV puts it in verses 34, as uh, the scribe again reiterates the same thing, that you answered it true to the scripture, and he adds something more so, so wonderfully. 
uh, not that Jesus didn't know that, but he was adding something even more beautiful to what the answer that Jesus had given. It is only to sh show that there was a right understanding that this scribe had. We read that from verses 32 and 33. Let me read that for us. And the scribe said unto him, Well, master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. What the scribe adds is also the, the um, if you might say, the footnote of the sum and substance of the law. The footnote of the sum and substance of the law is that God is more pleased in what our lives bring in our love, in our adoration, and in all our heart uh, to him rather than our burnt offerings or sacrifices that. And so the scribe had this right footnote and to that Jesus gives a receptive encouragement in verses 34, let me read that and then we will go on to understand the whole uh, aspect of this sermon for our application. So in verses 34 Jesus says, and when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he answered very wisely. He said unto himself, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God, and no man after that dost ask him any question. Jesus didn't say anything to flatter somebody. Jesus was never interested to try to uh, make some kind of a, a statement without any meaning. He saw that there was something distinct discreet, something wise about the way the scribe that had come forth has understood. Very interestingly, Matthew has a different account of it. Uh, and of course, when we read the portion below, what Jesus does is that in verses 38 onwards, he says, and he said unto them in his doctrine, beware of the scribes. In general, the scribes, those who were meticulously copying the law, who dealt with the law, who had the scriptures with them, were only given to knowing what the scriptures say, but not giving themselves to the scripture. But uh, one thing that is discreetly observed is that this scribe happened to understand even not just the, the great commandment which he had asked as a question and affirmed when Jesus answered, but he understood even the footnote of it, which is, that it is more acceptable to God, pleasing to God, than even the burnt offerings. That is to love God and to love our neighbor, or to keep, our, keep the commandments that God has given, the foremost of which is to love God, and the rest of which is to love our neighbor, is actually more than burnt offerings. We get to see this from what we see in the lesson, life lesson that Saul gives to us in uh, first. Samuel chapter 15, we all know the story when Saul was given a command by God to destroy all of the Amalekites. We note that Samuel happened to come to recognize in the life of Saul that he had spared some of them to bring as a burnt offering to God. And to that Samuel gives this word in 1 Samuel chapter 15 verses 22. Samuel said, had the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of the rams. We see that the God of the Old Testament is a God who prescribed sacrifices, who had given to them the portrait of sacrifices, primarily to show that that portion is what God is going to do for the remission of sins of mankind and without the death of a sacrificial lamb of God who takes the sin of this world, there is no means of 
redemption that is possible. Now, all that to suffice to say that God of the Bible who gave these sacrifices is more pleased when we bring obedience to the table rather than sacrifices to the table. That is a life lesson that we learn from the life of Saul. And not just that, we read even in a number of places in, Malak, in Micah chapter 6 verse 8 where God gives to us what is required. This is what Micah summarizes in saying, He hath shewed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before thy God. We don't see any amount of sacrifices being mentioned there, but God desires that we have an obedience to Him in an overall sense. And so when we see these two aspects, that is, the first aspect is the mandate, the second aspect is the meaning, we come to see something so beautiful. The first one, when we come to the word mandate, it comes from this word command. The word command, the second part of that word has this word mandate in it, meaning it is an authoritative prescription. That is why I began with the story of a doctor giving a prescription. God had given an authoritative prescription. Yes, a command or a commandment has the force of the one who has that authority behind it. It is not mere buddy or somebody who is at our level giving us that mandate. It is the one who is the most high, the maker of all things, the one who made us, giving us the prescription for our lives. It is an authoritative prescription. Think about this, when a car is manufactured, it's often talked about uh, in a simple example that um, it seems like Henry Ford, who is probably, I, I don't know if it is true, um, happened to actually uh, drive his vehicle and come across a, a vehicle, which is a Ford vehicle that was left on the side. And sitting beside it is an owner of that vehicle who purchased it. It is said that when Henry Ford saw that he, he, took it, he took his vehicle aside and stopped and actually helped that owner and get, got that car fixed. And uh, when the owner was surprised that what made this man who actually stopped his car as rich as he seemed in his suit, take his efforts to put this vehicle, the Ford vehicle that he owned, right and uh, as he was leaving and uh, as the owner of the car was asking, may I know your good name? And to that, he gave his card and left and went away. And as he saw the card, he saw that it was Henry Ford and he understood the, and connected the dots. And when we think about that, it is the same thing with man. When God comes to give the commandments that he gave in the Ten Commandments, which actually has ex been extended as the book of the law in the first five books that Moses gives to us. In all the ceremonial laws, in all the dietary laws, in all the moral law that God had given, God actually gave in a prescription for our lives. What is best for our lives? A man of God summarizes this so beautifully. When we come to this word commandment, it's not our favorite word. Talk to a child who gets uh, to receive a command from his parents. You would note that they see us more like a party spoiler. They, we are trying to spoil their fun. Never, it's not, it's not received in a welcoming way. So is it with man. Man never in his fallenness sees commands as a blessing. But a man of God puts it straight. One word to summarize the Ten Commandments, he says, he says, it can be summarized in this word called sacred. All the Ten Commandments can be summarized in this word called sacred. Because when God made man, God made man in his own image, it seems. And because he has the image of his upon us, he sees everything about our life sacred. 
Our worship is sacred, which is why we ought to love God with supreme love. Not anything else in this world. And anything else that comes before God is going to deprive the sacredness that God had put in man when he made us in his own image. We saw that in that uh, image, that the question that uh, regarding taxes that the, the, the Pharisee had come. And Jesus asks, whose image is inscribed on this coin? And then Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what belongs to God. And you know what belongs to God? You and I owe everything of our life, we owe it to God. The moment, every moment that we breathe, we owe our existence to Him. Because His image is upon us. And that ought to be rendered to Him as we render to the Caesar the taxes that are due. And now, and now when we come to this, the life that God had given is so sacred that He wanted to give these commandments that preserve its sanctity. And so our worship is sacred. Our relationships are sacred. We are to honor our father and our mother. And going on, our, our possessions, our treasure is sacred. That is why we are to, we are to not to uh, violate the sacredness of somebody else's property, which is why we ought not to steal. We ought not to actually spoil the sacredness of life in somebody who is made in God's image, which is why we ought not to kill. We never see it that way, but we see these commandments as breaking or giving boundaries to our freedom, right? That's what we see in our fallenness, but God had meant it to be for our good, for our benefit. And that is why these commandments that God had given are to preserve the sanctity of life that he had given beautifully designed for ourselves. And so when we come to this word called mandate, which comes from this word called commandment, we come to see that it is an authoritative prescription. It is an authoritative prescription, so much so that God has given in those commandments what is the best for our lives. And so when we come to this word called prescription, uh, again, coming back to this doctor's story, uh, the doctor, after he had come to talk, he had come to see all the vitals of his patient, was giving this recommendation and saying, I recommend to you one hour daily exercise. And the man was actually responding and saying, oh, you don't know how busy I am. I have, every week I have to travel so long. Maybe like me, he might have been saying, I'm a software engineer, I don't have time. I have a family, I have uh, that, this, I have no time for workout. Uh, and to that, most often these doctors are very polite and they say, try to adjust or try to get your workout, that'll be good for you, and they leave it there. But this doctor was not so, and he said in this way, what fits your busy schedule? Can you answer me? And he says, what fits your busy schedule? Exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? You can choose. And then that came to him as a mandate more than a, a prescription. Often we see the commandment that God gives as a, as a suggestion, as a recommendation like the doctor's giving. But the truth is, God actually gave it as a mandate so that we see the best for our lives in those commandments, in loving God, in loving our neighbor of our, as ourselves. We see that we, on, we not only come to fulfill the mandate that God gave, we find the meaning for our lives in it. This is so wonderful. This same commandment that Jesus gave is, is brought to us in a different setting. In uh, Luke chapter 11, let's come to that, Luke chapter 10, Verses 27, we'll close in a few more minutes, but follow me here please carefully. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 onwards, we come to see that there is another lawyer who stood up. And we all know that this is this rich young uh, ruler or lawyer. And he came and he stood up and tempted him, that is Jesus, saying, Luke chapter 10, verse 25, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? 
And to that Jesus says in verse 26, Luke 10, 26, he said unto him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, this is the lawyer answering. In, instead of Jesus answering, here the lawyer is answering. And the lawyer's answer is, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thy self. Very interesting that these lawyers already knew the right answers, but their heart was not there with the right answers. They knew it with their mind, they memorized it, they were able to answer, they were able to give the right answers, but had their heart far from the right answers. One such was this lawyer, and in verse 28, and he said unto him, that is to the lawyer, thou has answered right, as opposed to the lawyer who was responding to Jesus' answer. Jesus answers here and says, thou has answered right, this do, and thou shall live. Wonderful, we come to see that Jesus didn't give the other aspect of the gospel where he says, you are dead in your sins unless you are born again, you cannot etern inherit eternal life. That's usually my expectation of what I would give as an answer if I were there in Jesus' place. But Jesus didn't give that answer. It's important why Jesus didn't give that answer, which is, he says that there is life in commandments. When you and I received the commandments that God had given, God actually induced into those commandments life, abundant life. And the sad part is, in our fallen sinful nature, we don't see life. We think those are death. Those are, those are not good for us. But Jesus clarifies that there is life in the commandment. Because commandment has the force of authority behind it. Imagine when God spoke things into creation and existence. He said, let there be light. That was the force that caused all things into coming into existence. Such is the power behind God's command. And exactly, God had put his power and his force behind even those ten commandments. And you know, what happens is, had that lawyer who knew the answer, the right answer, and who relayed the right answer, had he taken into thought, examined his heart, that his, that his heart was far from loving God, that his heart was far from loving his neighbor, he would have come to understand that unless I am born again, unless I see that I am dead in my sins and trespasses, I cannot inherit eternal life. Which is why he asked this question. Notice in the later portion, uh, the Levite, he asks, sorry, uh, that, that lawyer, he himself asks, who is my neighbor? He wanted to justify himself and say, I'm already doing these commandments. But we come to see that his heart was far from living out those commandments and coming to recognize his desperate need for being born again receiving Jesus as the Lord and Savior. Now, the reason I say this is, the, the clue to meaning in life, the clue to meaning in life, as a man of God put it, is found in relationships, it seems. The clue to meaning in life is found in relationships. When, when our relationship with God first sets right, that when we come to receive Jesus as the Lord and Savior, you and I get the blessed privilege of setting our vertical relationship right. From then flows setting our horizontal relationships, that is to love our neighbor in the right way because of a God who comes and indwells in our life. He begins to induce meaning to our life and fulfillment to our life. And which is why the right... the... the... the a sense of life that we come to see is fulfilled, is brought to bear when we come to see that the two commandments that Jesus relayed here is going to bring meaning to our life and the way it does this is so beautiful. This is why I titled my message as the mandate and meaning in Jesus Christ. You know, before you and I are in Jesus Christ, 
all that you and I can do is only know what these commandments are and know with our mind, know with our answer as an answer to what we might come to as a question. But something beautiful happens when Jesus comes to our lives and when we come into Jesus. And that is this law, this law that we have come to read in the Bible is going to be written on the tables of our heart. It's going to become something that is so dear to our heart. Take note of this uh, promise that we have seen, we see in Jeremiah. Uh, let's turn to Jeremiah. Actually, even Ezekiel as well. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. Let's turn there. Ezekiel chapter 36. Talking about the new covenant that we we are promised in the Bible, we come to see Ezekiel chapter 20, 36, verse 26. A new heart will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And then take note in verse 27. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. You know, something beautiful happens when God makes us a new creation. In this new covenant that we come to, God takes this law that is on the pages of the scripture and he puts it on the tablets of our heart, where he writes it on our heart and makes us fall in love with his law, makes us fall in love with his law so much so that we would abhor sin and we would love the Lord who has written and recreated us again back in his new image, in his image again, when he makes us a brand new creation. Turn with me here uh, again in, in the same um, scripture in Jeremiah chapter 32 verses 39, the same uh, portion is given as Jeremiah outlines uh, this new commandment, Jeremiah chapter 32, verses 39. Let me read that for us. Jeremiah chapter 32, verses 39. And I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them and I will not turn away from them and do good and to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. This is what is the beauty that we come to experience when we come into Jesus Christ. Man has no ability in himself to keep the commandments. Yes, the mandate is there, but that mandate had proved to be the death sentence for man when man brought himself in his willful rebellion against the single commandment that God had put to man, that thou shall not eat of the fruit of the forbidden tree, and the day you shall eat, you shall die. God brought, man brought upon himself, from the mandate, he brought himself into death. But God didn't leave us in that death. In the death of his son and his resurrection, God re recreates us with this new heart, where he writes, rewrites his law upon our hearts, where we have a new life, a, a new love to his law, a new love to the God of this law, a new love to the neighbor who is made in his own image. And so when we come to see Hebrews chapter 10, sorry, Hebrews chapter 8, talking about this new commandment in chapter 8, when God has done away with the old commandment, he gives us this new commandment, he says in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Say the law, say the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Have you come to have Jesus as your God? 
If so, it's not just the mandate that you have in, in the very reality that he is your maker, but you also have the meaning for your life. The very moment you have entered to being in Jesus, being born again, that God does supernaturally, he says, I will put my laws into their mind and write them on their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. When Jesus, as we come to the table, as we look to the Lord, when he, in Matthew chapter 26, verses 26, we come to see that he says to his disciples, this is the new